Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Amanda Harrison Keithley, a Community Engagement Manager for the DIA. Thank you for joining us today. During the program, I'd like to encourage you to please ask questions. You can do this by selecting the Q&A icon on the right hand side of your screen. Questions will be read by Christine Mark, the DIA's Manager of Volunteer Development. This event is being recorded, so if you'd like to watch it again later, you can find a link on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. And we're going to share a link to the, those pages in our comments box. Next week, we're mixing up our regularly scheduled programming with a film. This special event will be limited to the first 200 participants. The event will start by taking your questions about the film with DIA film curator Elliot Wilhelm. We will then provide you a link to the film with a password. Today, we'll learn about pop art with our hosts, Cindy Patrick, Ray Henney, and Jim O'Malley. Please give them a warm welcome. Welcome, welcome to the latest, to the latest edition, edition of the Detroit, Detroit Institute, Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum. The theme today is pop art and the works we will be looking at are from the height of that movement and were included in the DIA's 2019 exhibition from Camelot to Kent State, Pop Art 1960 to 1975. For those of you who are part of Howard's fan club, um, I know you might be a little bit disappointed to see me here today, but he's getting um, a well-deserved rest and uh, they're putting me up to bat. So I'm Cindy Patrick, DIA docent for 15 years, former vice chair and chair of the IPV committee. I'm a member of the DIA's learning interpretation committee. I'm also a board member at the Plymouth Community Arts Council and have helped to organize an artisan residency program in Michigan's Thumb. Um, I'll be taking on these hosting duties today and would like to introduce you to our presenters, Ray Henney and Jim O'Malley. Hi, I'm Ray Henney. Um, I am now uh, co-chair of the IPB or Dosen Committee. I'm also a practicing attorney at the Detroit-based law firm of Honigman LLP. Um, so as Cindy mentioned, today we're exploring pop art. So what is pop art? Well, it was a movement that was started in the late 50s by American and British artists uh, based upon popular modern culture with the purpose of exploring our commercial society. In particular, the movement focused on everyday mass-produced goods uh, and also commercial imagery and commercial techniques. It was both the critique of mass media and how it affects our lives, and it was a celebration of mass media and popular culture, hence pop art. It also very much challenged tr traditional concepts of art, or what is art? What is high art or museum quality art? Jim, want to introduce yourself and bring us to the next piece. Hi, everyone. My name is Jim O'Malley. I'm a docent at the DIA. I've spent my career in commercial real estate, and I'm now retired. I'd like to start today's presentation with Crying Girl by Roy Lichtenstein. It's probably one of the most famous pop art pieces. Here we have Lichtenstein embracing popular culture by taking what was considered low art, a picture from a comic book, and elevating it to high art. He is celebrating popular culture, and in particular, American culture. In effect, Lichtenstein, through pieces like Crying Girl and our next piece, blurs the distinction between fine art and mass culture. And he does it in a fun and playful way. So let's take a look at Crying Girl. Lichtenstein appropriated, that is, he took the image from mass culture and he took a lot of imagery from mass culture, from advertisements, but especially from popular comic books. Comic books were written for teenagers and adults and tended to emphasize melodrama, romance, and violence. He takes that imagery, which is even smaller than the palm of your hand from 
from a, inside of a comic book. He crops it, he cuts it smaller, changing the image, and then he blows it up. This image is approximately 18 by 24 inches. And he makes us look at this image very differently than how we would be looking at an image in a comic book or on a comic strip. What is particularly unique about this artwork in terms of style is that he has taken a technique called Bende dots. Those are the red dots that you see uh, through the woman's face and in her hand. It's almost forms like a grid work and it's a commercial printing technique created by Benjamin Day in the 1890s. And it was done to create midtones or tones. So normally, and we're going to be talking a lot today about printmaking and screen prints. And when you're doing um, printmaking and you apply the ink, let's say black ink, it comes on as a solid color and the artist is able to apply it to where he wants it with the other areas remaining blank or white on paper. So in essence, you have just black or white. Benjamin Day, through the Ben Day dots, was able to create tone qualities or tone here. And what, so he takes the, what is the, the pink background of, of her skin and he puts on these red dots to create a tone. What was unique about Roy Lichtenstein is that he takes these, these dots and makes it part of the artwork. Normally, if you were reading a newspaper or a magazine and you saw a picture, you wouldn't even notice the, the, the dots, the Bende dots. But here, he's able not just to create, use them to create tone, but he makes them an integral part of the artwork. Speaking of the red dots, it's just as a sort of a fun sideline. When Roy Lichtenstein took the art to the printers to be uh, to be made, it was in it was done in offset lithography. They were sitting around talking about what color of red, dark red, light red. They weren't sure which color of red to use for the dots, and they found a package of cigarettes, and it was the red color on the package of cigarettes from a cigarette machine or a vending machine in the printer's building that they ended up using that for this color of red. Crying Girl embraces popular culture. And as I mentioned, it was printed with offset lithography. Offset lithography is a very commercial, almost industrial style of printing. It was, it's what daily newspapers and magazines are printed on. It's, 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 it's almost, it's a manufacturing process, not an artistic hands-on process. And that was unique in 1963 because Roy Lichtenstein took this commercial printing technique and yet he still considered it art. The reason they used offset lithography was that he was, th this piece was made into a poster and the poster was done as an advertisement for his uh, solo exhibition at the um, Leo Castelli Gallery. The Leo Castelli Gallery is in New York. It was very famous among pop artists. He, for example, uh, this gallery was the first gallery that Jasper Johns, Frank Stella, Roy Lichtenstein, they each had their first solo exhibitions here. So he, using offset lithography to advertise for this gallery opening, he made lots of posters for it. And he used, they used very cheap paper. It, was, it wasn't meant really to be kept. Pop art was disposable, expendable. Interesting enough, this has become a real collector's item. And, and it's become, and it has dramatically increased in value. This cheap paper poster has really increased in value. Cindy, I was wondering, when you were a child, did you ever read comic books or did you, was this something you read? Well, you know, Jim, I had three older brothers, so there were a lot of comic books laying around our house. And my favorite was Fantastic Four, because out of the Fantastic Four, there was one woman and her name was Sue Storm and she was called the Invisible Woman. So I would always go through the pile and try to find uh, the Fantastic Four. So yeah, I did, I liked, I did like comic books. Good. Okay, can we go on to our next piece? 
Uh, I'd like to talk to them a little bit together. When you see it, you'll understand. It's, it's a very similar piece by Roy Lichtenstein. The name of it is Sweet Dreams, Baby, Pow. And this play with words and lettering was again appropriated from a comic book published again in 1965, the same year. And I believe it was called Our Fighter. Don't hold me to that. And it was about the US military. This art piece highlights comic violence. High art, low art, mid-brow art. Comic books was always considered low art, low art. In fact, during the 1950s, on the floor of the Senate, hearings were held, televised hearings, about how comic books were rotting the minds of America's youth. They were, this was, comic books were, were this was the, comic books was considered very low art. So this is the context in which Lichtenstein saying this is high art, he's blowing it up, he's having fun with it, and he's making it um, a radical change on how art is viewed. Among the highbrow critics at the time, this, was, this art was considered hideous. In fact, they didn't even think of it as art. Um, they, the comic books were, were disposable. They were read by adults and, and teenagers, maybe going down the wrong path. And he takes it and he elevates it to high art. The discussion of what is art has been going on for a long time. It's really started with, with modern art. It goes all the way back to Claude Monet. The discussion was, it's not art. It's not a painting. It's just a mere impression. It's not art. It's just a comic book image. It's not art. It's just dot, dot, dot. This question of what is art is with us and continues to go on with us even today. Christine, any questions? Not at this time, Jim. OK, what I'd like to do at this point then, since we're looking at a screen print and there's it's one of four major groups of printmaking. The four groups of printmaking are intaglio, lithography, relief and screen printing. In screen printing um, of all the, the of those is probably seen to be the most easiest to understand because you don't have to look or think of it in reverse. The image on the screen will print directly onto the paper or the t-shirt or whatever you're doing um, exactly the way you draw it. Screen printing is the process of pushing ink through a screen or through a mesh onto a, a piece of paper or the t-shirt or whatever you're using. And what will happen is the artist will flood the screen with ink and with a squeegee and he'll bring it down and and the ink will will he'll flood the screen with ink and then when he comes back with the squeegee that for that minute or instant that squeegee will sort of hit the paper and the ink will transfer onto it that's a, a screen print okay so you're probably thinking, how do you prevent the ink from going through the screen to where you don't want to? That's, you know, what I was always thinking, because you put ink on the entire screen. I brought with me today a, a screen along with a squeegee, and I'd like to show it to you. OK, and how they typically did it was they took and they would apply an emulsion. OK, this can you see the screen? This is the purple area. If all this purple area, ink will not be allowed to go through. It can go through where the image is, okay? So here you have the image. There's even some of the bend day dots on this image. And you would take your squeegee, okay? Flood the screen with ink, apply it, and it would be transferred onto the paper, okay? You would have to do this process for every color change that you'd wanted to do. So if there was four colors in the print, some prints have up to 40 colors. You would have to do a separate print and you would have to put on this area. And what keeps this area here is they would print, basically they create a stencil. In a stencil with plastic acetate, they would perforate 
or they would cut away where they want the ink to be able to go through. And when it's pressed through, the ink comes on it. Okay, that's all there is to it. Christine, any questions on screen printing? Uh, no, Jim, but there was a question uh, maybe you can address in regard to pieces on paper and perhaps why we don't leave them hanging for long periods of time. Oh, the reason is unlike canvas and oil paintings in that, paper is very fragile. It can also discolor very easily and the particularly a lot of the inks and, and if you're using watercolors in that, they, they do not have an extremely long life. So they're only allowed to be kept out or shown in the museum for about anywhere from three to five months or so. And then they have, they call it, put it in them back to sleep. They put them back into storage for typically a few years. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jim. Sure. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Ray, who's going to be talking about Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol is one of the most famous uh, uh, printmakers of our time. Ray? Thanks, Jim. And this is Andy Warhol's self-portrait from 1967. And it is a screen print, just as Jim was just describing. But this isn't a small screen print. These are actually two separate each of those portraits are separate screen prints that are more than six feet tall and six feet wide. They're very large. Warhol did these when he was about 40 years old. He was, before this, the top advertising artist in New York in the early 1960s, before he decided to devote himself to his art. He started using techniques from advertising to create his works, including screen printing, and multiples. And as Jim was just saying, he became the most well-known, influential, and controversial artist of the pop art area, era. Uh, in his New York studio was called The Factory, and the reason it was called The Factory was a reference to the commercial nature of art. It was also a gathering place for other artists and for um, Warhol's wealthy patrons. He was extremely popular. Now these two portraits are part of a series of 10 that were done for Expo 67. And the DI always hangs them together, these two together, to suggest the idea of serial production, which is what Warhol wanted to suggest. It's the, that idea of the same thing over and over again. Think of advertising, you know, commercials over and over again. The, the taglines or the, the slogans that the, the uh, manufacturer wants you to know over and over again. And these are large. I mean, these are over six feet in square. And so it's very much in your face. It's like a billboard. Hey, Cindy. Yeah. Cindy, take a look at this. So what do you notice about uh, these two self portraits? Well, I'm going to use my fabulous cursor here. It uh, is fabulous. <laughs> No question about it. Uh, when I'm looking at the one on the left, it sort of looks like it's a, a positive image, almost as if it were taken from a photograph. And it looks like a younger man. He's got, you know, a lot of hair, kind of a nice, nicely coiffured haircut. And then he has his hand um, in front of his mouth and it's kind of a gesture of um, either he's being thoughtful, thinking about something, or maybe he might be getting ready to say something important. And then when I look at the one on the right, where his face is primarily printed in red, it sort of makes me think of a negative image, you know, a positive and a negative. So it, it, that pose is interesting, isn't it, Cindy? And you are, it, that seriousness of that pose that Warhol uh, shows himself. And it's it's really based upon the matinee idols of the 40s. You know, this kind of, you know, picture of, you know, seriousness and, you know, image. And, um, you know, Cindy, I don't know if you know this, Jim O'Malley takes selfies like this, you know, very serious, <laughs> you know, like this. Yeah. Sometimes he's like this. And then there's, of course, there's his Boy Scout look where he's looking out in the, you go to his Facebook page. It's just filled with those things. In any, event, so, in any event, in any event, and the colors are interesting, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But what 
Warhol's trying to do is construct an identity as a celebrity, you know, with this pose and these multiple versions. And as we mentioned, it's screen print. So this isn't, you know, uh, there's no paintbrushes involved. And the image was from original black and white photo. And Warhol instructed the screen, screen print, print in the company to exaggerate the colors, exaggerate that light and dark. And these colors are pure indulgence, Cindy. And, and of the 10, they're all slightly different with these bold kinds of colors. So by using this mechanical means of production, Warhol is questioning concepts of creativity and what is high art. And in this pose, ultimately, in using, you know, this, you know, this uh, beauty shot, you know, using commercial screen printing and having serial production, you know, multiple productions of the image, Warhol is communicating several ideas about pop art, including this idea of establishing celebrity. If one image is good, more are better. And think of that as continues today in our social media. Um, also, it's emphasizing this sort of quality of modern life that uh, everything's ordinary, that, you know, one thing's as good as the next, that there's no longer a uniqueness to life. And then, yeah, the, the next photo, uh, you know, shows the self-portrait, and that's a photo of Warhol. This was done 18 years later after the screen prints in Detroit. You can see the Renaissance Center in the back. And, you know, it poses the question about these self-portraits, you know, that perhaps there's also a different message, maybe a more personal message for Warhol, that the uh, image appears to be a glimpse of himself using this outrageous persona to mask maybe an intensely private person. Questions, Christine? Yes, um, there are a few questions in regard to the uh, screen printing method. And uh, for instance, how did Warhol um, keep the colors separate when it got passed through the screen to apply the different colors? How is that? How does that work in general? And then could you just mention uh, how Warhol approached that that uh, concept or that method? You know, I'm going to defer to Jim on some of the very technical natures because he has a more technical, but I understand the reason the, the way they separate the colors and make sure that one color saturates at a time is they mm -hmm. use different substances to block uh, the areas they don't want the color to be in on. And there's different kinds of methods depending on, on the screen printing. And now, Christine, I've reached the limit of my knowledge about that. It, okay. What was the second part of the question? I, I, know, I know that's what they do for lithography. Um, uh, the next question was, uh, Andy Warhol, uh, do you have any idea how this photograph was taken? Did, is this a selfie of him? No, it isn't. He had a photographer do it. He, uh, he posed for it. He had this idea about doing screen prints for himself. Okay, and I heard one time that Andy Warhol was really into those like multiple photo booth pictures. Have you heard about that? Yes. Yes, he was, he, where he would go into a photo booth and pose and so forth. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this may be a product of one of those, but this was taken, you know, he posed intentionally with the idea of using the photograph for a screen print. Okay. And maybe Jim can chime in about screen printing. I can. The question is what they would do is here, I'll bring it back the screen. What they would do is they would apply an emulsion onto it and the ink would, could not go through. These purple areas where the emulsion has been applied, the ink can't go through. What they would then do is if there was one color on it, OK, they would allow that to dry. They would then put with a typically nowadays they use plastic acetate sheets. They would attach that and it would perforate out or cut out where they wanted to do. They could put it over what has already been colored if they wanted to change, somewhat change that color or put an additional color on top of, of ink that's already been applied or into a, a completely new area. And so that's that when they cut out the with this plastic acetate sheet, they could open it up 
you can see through it, the light would go through it. They could then flood the screen with the ink and, and the, the, that color of ink would go onto the, onto the paper. Does that make sense? I don't have another question. I'll let you know if I do. Okay. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate right, it. Yeah. So let's go to the next one, Cindy, if we could. And this is another um, work by Warhol. It is also a screen print. It's called Jackie 3, and it's obviously, for many of us, it's, this image is known. It's Jackie Kennedy at the time. Now, then uh, later in life, Jackie Onassis. Uh, it's um, about 40 inches tall and about 30 inches wide. And this work is based upon the Life magazine publication. Cindy, could you turn it to the next? Uh, right. So Life magazine was a very popular American publication, which was bought, uh, which brought current events to American homes. Uh, it was known for the quality of, of its photography and photojournalism. You know, they had these crisp, clear, interesting images. It was like a picture book. Hey, Jim, I don't know if when you were a uh, child, if your parents had a subscription to Life magazine, but I remember it coming in the mail and just being fascinated, just looking at the pictures because they were so interesting and so vivid. Well, in the mid 60s, this issue of Life magazine uh, contained iconic photographs of the assassination, assassinated President John F. Kennedy's family viewing the procession during his a November 1963 funeral. It was an event, a tragic event, that shaped the American psyche at the time. Indeed, the funeral was extensively covered by all the major television and radio stations and all the um, major media print. Here, can you go back to the next slide, the previous slide, Cindy? Sure. Thanks. Here, Warhol has made screen prints of four photos from that Life magazine. So Jim, we're just talking about screen printing and so forth. What do you notice about this screen print? What I, it's, it's different a little bit. What the first thing that I notice, it's almost the, the gradient of the printing. It's almost a little blurry. It's not crisp and clean. And it looks like it was done almost quickly. He, there's obviously the four images and the images were just sort of put on um, almost like he didn't take a lot of time or effort um, in doing it. And I, and I was wondering, Ray, is that part of what he was trying to portray or is that part of the imagery here? Yes, you know, exactly, um, Jim. You know, Warhol wasn't interested in duplicating the slick presentation of the Life magazine photos. He blew up these photos and then he cropped them to sort of change the focus. Hey, Cindy, could you use your that magical, wonderful cursor of yours? Is, and uh, the upper right hand corner that has Jackie Kennedy, right, with the soldier behind. Right, now go to the next slide, which is the cover of the magazine. And could you circle her again? Notice that it's inverted. Warhol has inverted that. Uh, he's Sort of playing with the image in a way for you, in the way, go yes, go back, in the way that he wants you to sort of see the image. And then, Jim, to your point, he doesn't align the imaging in the screen printing process, but he overlaps them. And he also doesn't have the plates cleaned. You were talking about the plates and so forth. He doesn't have them clean during the printing process. So by leaving the paint on the screen, it builds up on the screen mesh, you know, blurring the lines of the print and making the edges irregular. The result is this image that has a very grainy appearance and it almost looks like it's breaking down, like the image is breaking down. You know, so, so much different than maybe the careful process of screen printing traditionally done. So Jim, you know, why would he do this? So is Warhol communicating or commenting on our commercial media driven modern culture where even the most private personal moments are exploited uh, to be a public viewing event? Or is Warhol commenting on Jackie, Ona Jackie Kennedy's outward appearance of steady strength during the funeral for the media 
and her actual personal internal emotions of devastating grief. Christine, any questions? Um, no, not really in regard to the screen print. There was one question in regard to the Life magazine cover. And okay. uh, one of our viewers said that they have a copy of that particular Life magazine and uh, they were wondering how collectible it was. So um, they're just reflecting on a piece they have in, in their own personal collection. I will tell you, I, I don't know anything about collecting magazines, yeah. but I can understand why they've saved it for this long. For those of us who were around then, and I was a young person at the time, it was um, a very traumatic experience and a very memorable, memorable experience. So I'm not surprised that people have retained them. They, hey, Ray, yeah, hey, I have a uh, question. Sure. Uh -huh, go ahead, Cindy. On the lower um, bottom right, yes. do you know if that photograph of her was from that day in Dallas? No. That's, I don't know if it was or not. My understanding was it was for, that these images were from the, the particular Life magazine and whether or not Life had some sort of, you know, retrospect about the assassination. I just don't know, Cindy. It's, it's a good question. It's a good question because, and I know why you asked, that hat that she has on, I think you're right. I think she did wear it on the day he was assassinated. Yeah, the hat looks like the hat she had on the day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, and then yeah. I did notice that the Life magazine was only a quarter in 1963. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a lot of entertainment for the, at the time for me, just, just, you know, sitting on the floor and leafing through that. So, uh, uh, Ray, yeah. Ray, we have another comment too, uh, in that uh, the viewer is noticing how Warhol really hits on social political commentary what's going on in the nation and the times of the days and more so uh the viewer felt than Lichtenstein, and perhaps gives us a, a lot to think about that warhol gave us a lot to think about i i think that's right and there are other works of the dia that obviously we're not showing that are very um socially and politically charged questioning um there are Many of the pop art images, and some of them that we'll be seeing today are fun. As I said, they are embracing mass media, and others are questioning our cultures. And the Warhol certainly was um, very poignant in doing so. So not only reflecting on everyday objects, but, but he dove into the more political and social times of the 1960s. And, and gave us um, something to think about in, in regard to what was going on in our nation. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that's why he was, he's maybe the most famous and popular of the pop artists. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. Okay. Jimbo, you're on. Well, Ray, the next piece we have is called Profile Airflow. And it's by a sculptor by the name of Klaus Oldenburg. Klaus Oldenburg, though he was a printmaker, he was primarily known as, as a sculptor. Profile airflow is a multiple. That is a, a our term, which means it's which was used for three-dimensional objects that were identically produced, multiply produced, often produced with new materials like plastics, cardboard, or plexiglass. The reason I'm mentioning this is that multiples were new to the art world in an innovation of pop art. In this case, airflow is a multiple of 75. He made 75 of them. And for as Oldenburg said, the multiple objects were for me the sculptor's solution to making a print. Printers, printmakers would do the same. They, they're called editions. So for example, Sweet Babe, uh, Sweet Dreams Baby, um, that was an addition, 200 were made. He would sign, uh, Lichtenstein signed each one and would note what number uh, it was. That particular piece we were looking at earlier was 120 out of 200. This piece, Profile Airflow, in terms of size and technically is one of the most complex multiples ever made. 
as as a pop art piece, it was extremely ambitious and complex. It took Oldenburg a long time to manufacture this piece, and he needed help doing it. He required the assistance of the master printers at Gemini GEL, which is located on Melrose Place in Los Angeles. In the early 60s, Oldenburg had moved to Venice, uh, California, but he loved uh, Los Angeles and all the difference he manufacturing, particularly of plastics. He called it a manufacturing paradise. He thought you, within an hour's drive, you could go to a manufacturing facility where they were utilizing the latest in plastic manufacturing materials and technologies. So this it was it was this area of Los Angeles that this manufacturing that he gravitated to. Yet the subject matter of the Chrysler Airflow was produced was the Chrysler Airflow. The Chrysler Airflow was produced in Highland Park, Michigan from 1934 to 1937. About 30,000 or so of the cars were made. In the Airflow, the car was the first car design using streamlining as a base for um, building a sleeker automobile, one that is more aerodynamic and less susceptible to air resistance. It was a technological wonder that in the early, in the mid 1930s, they were exploring aerodynamics for cars in that. As a side note, it was also the first car, maybe because it was so technologically advanced, that that was driven over the newly completed Golden Gate Bridge. As a child, Oldenburg, growing up in Chicago during the 1930s, had a toy of this uh, Chrysler Airflow. Could you move to the next, uh, Cindy, could you go to the next one? Here's the picture of the Chrysler Airflow. His was also maroon, it was a wind up toy, okay? And um, for him, this piece of art in 1969 is a nostalgia for one of the highlights of US manufacturing. And he is doing it utilizing the latest techniques and materials. So let's go back, um, if you don't mind, to the, to the piece. As I've mentioned, it's a very complicated piece. It's made of what you're looking at, the green, is cast polyurethane. It's a relief, it's 3D. Below that, he created a lithograph, a two color lithograph. The, it was done in gray to create the grid work that you see in the background. And then in black, which was the, highlighting the car itself. You can see the tires and the fenders and, and so forth. That's a lithograph. The green plastic was what he, the polyurethane, what he wanted to do and what he asked Gemini GEL to create was a, a green polyurethane. He, what he wanted it to look like as if you were looking through a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the polyurethane not to be very hard to, to the touch. He wanted it to be almost flesh-like, having a soft uh, texture to it. So you, in all of this, was mounted onto an aluminum frame very technologically advanced. So you have this green polyurethane, which is molded into a three-dimensional relief of the car. You have a two-color lithograph, which lies below and consists of the contours and that of the, of the car, along with the grid pattern. And both parts were set within this welded aluminum frame. It took Gemini GEL approximately two and a half years to come up with the process to make this polyurethane cast. They made one it, and they printed them all off, the 75 that you, that you would see, the, the polyurethane very quickly discolored and they had to be discarded. They had to be all thrown away and they went back to the drawing board. It took Oldenburg over a year to create the form and create the sculpture for the casting. So this took a, this piece took a, a long time to make. And once they finally were able to pull it all together and it would go into production. Uh, Cindy, could you go down maybe one more? One more. And here you see 
the production while he's making the the relief and he's peeling off this 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 cast polyurethane relief they were only able to do one per day so they made 75 if they were working five days a week it would have taken them three almost four months just to make the pieces after he had spent a year designing it in G gemini gel spent almost over two years trying to come up with the plastic process that is part of the pop art they were using very modern te technologies materials in that that was all part of the process okay if we go back one cindy if you don't mind there's another photograph, which I think is sort of fun. Here you have a picture of Klaus Oldenburg in front of a, a Chrysler Airflow. The, there you can see the, there's a, a blanket down and there's a picnic going on, and it's at the home of Stan and Elise Grinstein. They were one of the founders of Gemini GEL. And I just think it's, it's a great piece because this took uh, uh, quite a period of time. Could we go back one more time just to the original artwork? And there it is. We're very lucky to have a piece of this quality in our collection. Christine, are there any questions? Yeah, there's a couple questions, Jim. One is, and I don't, I don't know if you mentioned this in the beginning, but how large is this piece? And then one of the viewers said it's amazingly beautiful. And is every um, one of these multiples the same color? OK, uh, first on the size. The size of it is 36 inches by 26 inches. So it's it's three feet long. And for a lithograph, that's a that's a major undertaking to do a lithograph that's over three feet long. So it's three feet by 26 inches, and all of them are that color. That's the color he wanted, this green color, like you're looking through a swimming pool as, as you try to describe it. So okay. is it almost translucent? Yes. You can see through it, you can see right through it to the lithograph, which is printed on the aluminum frame underneath this, this polyurethane relief. So you can see the grid work, which is on the aluminum frame and all of the black lines in that. That is not part of the cast green polyurethane. That is a lithograph on the aluminum frame that you're looking through the, the casting onto the, on, and looking at the, lithograph which is highlighting the car in its details and form okay and i know that um although this piece isn't on view right now because we're setting up for our cars exhibition maybe it's coming back for that uh, and in the past it has been on view um for extended periods of time so i do hope we see it again me too i think it's just a beautiful piece of artwork should we go on to the next one? It's another piece by Klaus Oldenburg. And on a, on a hot summer day like today, it's a good humor alphabet. And, and you can almost taste it when you're looking at it. I remember fondly when I was a child growing up in the city of Detroit, hearing the bells from the good humor truck coming down the road. And my sister and brother and I, we would have to dash off running to our mother to get the the money necessary to buy a good humor and we would come barely out of the house hoping that the truck hadn't driven away uh, that someone else had stopped and we'd chase after and and have and have our a good humor did you ever have good humor or did the truck ever roll down your street ray oh yes it's all part of the trial childhood trauma of chasing your mother around for a dime or a quarter so before that darn truck ran away right. and when you were particularly good i got a whole quarter so I, I could get the chocolate eclair good humor which was my personal favorite really my personal favorite was the fudgicle i i th i just loved it what i didn't like is the dripping so let's take a look at this klaus oldenburg had a commission to do something with with the alphabet with an alphabet and he couldn't think of anything. He was stumped. So he went to the local AMP grocery store and he sees the good humor bar or the package and the light bulb goes off. He comes back to his studio and he creates this print. That's not actually true. He comes back to his studio and he takes colored pencils 
and he draws this drawing, okay? He then takes that drawing and sends it to the printer. The printer photographs it, okay? And, 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 and makes it, turns it in and makes a print of it, okay? So in this piece, they also interestingly use the offset lithography. And as I mentioned, if you remember when I was talking about um, Lichtenstein, that is a heavy production commercial, almost industrial application used for printing mass, the daily newspaper or magazines like Life Magazine. It was not a hand process where every edition, like a screen print was done by hand with a squeegee in that. Here they were able to print um, uh, just literally thousands of these if, if needed. The good humor bar consists of this wonderful pop art marshmallow-like alphabet letter. Okay, you can see all the letters. They look, at least to me, look like marshmallows. And you can see up at the top left, someone has taken out a bite out of it and it's starting to drip down. And at the very bottom, you have a drip that's just about to fall. He's caught this piece at an exact moment in time. Okay, it, which is, and it's this artwork, this uh, good humor alphabet, this American culture, this, you know, this, this icon of American culture, the good humor, and he goes to it time and time again. Cindy, could you go to the next, uh, next page or screen? So here we have three different alphabet good humors done by Klaus Aldenberg. We have the first one, which we've talked about on the left. That's a, that's a pencil drawing that was turned into a lithograph. In the middle, we have a maquette. A maquette is simply an, a sculptor's term for a model. They would do a, a, a preliminary model or sketch, in this case it was a model, to see conceptually if the idea of what it was, he was doing or he was trying to realize uh, uh, trying to turn a concept into the, uh, uh, into the end product in, in a very small preliminary form. Here he did it with canvas and with K-Pack or stuffing underneath it. So it's really a fiber piece, okay? And based on a wood stick and a wood platform. And then on the third or on the far right, we have taking it from a simple drawing to a fiber piece of art, to this cast resin plated with polyurethane enamel with a bronze base and a wood for the stick, a, a very hard piece. Speaking of the middle piece, the, 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 the cloth or fiber piece, if you were wondering, eventually he did make it into a 12 foot tall um, uh, permanent piece for a Hollywood collector. Also, which I found of interest, the city of Lansing, our state capital, the Arts Commission approached Klaus Oldenburg and commissioned him to make a much, much larger version of this. It would have been Klaus Oldenburg's first public commission. Regrettably, the, the city of Lansing was unable to raise the necessary funds and it never happened. But it just, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting piece that I wish that the city of Lansing would have been able to, to do that. So here you see three different versions of the same piece based on a popular food, which was embraced by popular culture of the time and even today. Christine, any questions? Uh, no, we do have one comment and that was, um, the viewers said that they feel really fortunate to be able to attend uh, this talk and that the dedication of all of you as presenters was well noted by this viewer. Thank you. That was very thoughtful. Well, Christine. Well, now, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, well, Christine, anytime you, you see those, just read them. You can interrupt us yeah. just to, to read them. Okay. Break right in, Christine. Just say that one of our mothers had written in. <laughs> <laughs> if that was Christine, if that was true, or uh, Amanda, I would grab that zip code because if it was my mom, she's that that message came from heaven. So that zip yeah. code, I would like to keep. 
At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Ray. He's going to be doing a piece, a complicated piece called F111. And it really is a complicated piece. And it's one of these iconic pieces of pop art. There's a lot to it. It's called F111. And this is James Rosenquist. It's, this is dated 1974. That's when this lithograph and screen print was done. It's actually based on an oil painting, a large oil painting he had done in 1965 that was extremely uh, similar. So this is very large. It is, if you wouldn't mind using your cursor there, Cindy, it is three feet tall and over 24 feet wide, but it's in four separate panels. Could you point out the, the divisions? Yeah, there's, there's, and the reason is because it's too difficult to do lithographs and screen prints, you know, in, in 24 feet. So uh, it's it's got four separate panels that are meant to be shown, obviously, in unison. So the artist was actually born in the Midwest in the 1930s, and he studied art, but that's not what particularly influenced him. What did was his experience painting Phillips 66 gasoline signs on the highways and also painting billboards in Times Square. In those endeavors, um, you know, during those endeavors, he learned airbrushing, using paint rollers, and how to produce uh, images on a large scale. And he adopted the commercial imagery and techniques in his own pop art. And he is known for these billboard scale works that combine both commercial and everyday imagery. Um, and this one really has a slick appearance. So Cindy, let's unpack this a little bit. The two, the next two slides are uh, folk, yeah, close-ups. Why don't you take a look at both of them and just sort of point out things that, you know, you see. This is now the part that's to the left when, when, when we are looking at the uh, looking at the image. When you were first um, talking about the initial slide, it did remind me of a billboard. The, the kind of imagery. So I see something that looks like it's an airplane. Um, I see, looks like a tire. I see some kind of pattern over here that looks kind of like squiggly lines. I see what looks like um, a pattern where someone might have uh, taken the bristles of a brush like you do with a toothbrush and just sort of flipped some dots on there. Uh, these look like they might be the signs you'd see maybe at a golf course, at a tee. Uh, and if we go to the next one, I see, of course, a, an old-fashioned hair dryer, some light bulbs. Uh, I see USA Air Force, an umbrella. This looks like maybe it's smoke. And then again, I see these kind of the squiggly line pattern. Right, Cindy, there's, so there's a lot here. And you pointed out both military, you know, the fighter plane you were talking about, and commercial project products and imagery. And I'd like to focus on the commercial goods and imagery we, we first saw. So if you go to the next slide. Right. So we'll come back to that, the paint splashes and, and so forth. But you pointed out the tire, and that's actually a, a Firestone tire. And underneath the tire, you've got, you, you point out the flags, but you've got this cake, right? You've got this cake that's cut in half, looks inviting, makes you feel good. And then could you go to the next slide? The light bulbs. So at the time, General Electric was the largest manufacturer of light bulbs in the country by far, and certainly the most well-known. And it also made that hairdryer that is above that little girl. And isn't that little girl a precious image, particularly in the 1960s when this was originally done? I mean, you have this wonderful smile, delightful smile, this all-American little girl. And then um, you you point it, whoops, could you go back? Yep, sorry. That's all right. And then you pointed out the spaghetti right? This the spaghetti looking things to the right, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's a bit of commentary by the artist on our commercial society. So, you know, before the 60s, really, spaghetti was used, used to be ethnic food, right? It was 
usually homemade in restaurants or in the household, but it became fast food in a can. I mean, right, the saucer pan came out, you turned on the heat, you opened the can and you dumped it in. And that was the meal. And you can see, Cindy, see how orange, like the sauce is? It's like an orange color. It's not that deep red tomato sauce, you know, that you associate with, you know, marinara or, you know, normally pasta. Again, you know, it's a, uh, it's sort of a little, a commentary on the fast food culture. And I didn't know if you know this, but Jim, when he's at the museum working, he still brings a can of SpaghettiOs. You know, he heats up because he still eats the SpaghettiOs. Do you remember those? Can you go, to, go, go to the previous one? Right. So the spaghetti is also a signature of Rosenquist, and it's a way of him poking fun at the abstract expressionist movement. And that was the dominant artistic movement uh, beginning in World War II all the way into the 60s. And, um, you know, that what you call the toothbrush flatters and so forth is a, another reference to the art, the abstract expressionism. And it, it was, you know, using colors and forms and brush strokes that weren't meant to represent anything. And it was designed to explore sort of your inner self. You know, you, you contemplated the images and explored your subconscious. Well, the pop artists were rejecting that. They thought that that art had sort of passed its time and it was time to look at what was really going on and what was really influencing people. And then uh, on the military side, we had this jet plane and you wanna skip two down uh, to that, yeah, the F-111, there you go. So at the time, the F-111 was the most advanced fighter bomber in the military and it was extensively used in the Vietnam War for bombing missions. Could you go up one more slide? Up the other way. Back? Yes, please. There you go. And then you have this, this cigarette smoke and you have the atomic bomb next to it, right? And at the time in 1965, when he did the original image, it was now then widely becoming understood that cigarette smoke uh, uh, caused cancer, was thought to cause cancer. And in advertising, the cigarette companies were vehemently trying to overcome that image. And so he has the cigarette smoke look sort of like a mushroom cloud, like the atomic bomb, in reference perhaps to the devastating effects of tobacco. And then you have this, this umbrella in front of the, uh, in, in the atomic bomb. And it's, you know, it's interesting. So why? I mean, maybe to show that it, uh, you know, we really don't have any way to uh, to defend against it. Or is it, you know, again, commercialism, you know, putting a nice image, sort of a friendly, you know, familiar image in front of something to sort of hide its, its devastation. So, you know, Cindy, it's really interesting. So he combines these everyday pop products with these devastating military products. So why? This is really a critique of the American commercialism. The companies such as Firestone and General Electric were best known through their commercials for selling tires, hair dryers, and light bulbs, but substantial portions of those companies' revenues was from manufacturing for the military. The F-111 is an example. Um, it, Firestone and General Electric were significant suppliers of components for that military jet, including the engine and its bombs. And at the time when the Vietnam War was particularly unpopular, uh, Rosenquist is exposing that the feel-good image that these companies present to the public hides the fact that such companies are making tremendous revenues by making weapons of mass destruction. Questions, Christine? Um, there was a question in regard to uh, where these pieces are all installed right now. And uh, if you could just mention the deinstallation of the contemporary galleries for the cars sure. exhibition, I, yes. in addition to you know that many of these pieces are on paper, but uh, one of the viewers 
wanted to know where they could see the popsicles. And, and I know that those are in storage uh, uh, because of the cars exhibition. Right, so actually only one of the items that we're uh, showing today is on view, and that's the Warhol self-portraits. Um, and they're on view. The contemporary galleries are um, being um, reinstalled to show the cars exhibit. So that particular piece has been moved from its traditional location and it's uh, in a special exhibit room on the second floor on the other side, um, on the south side of the building. And you can see it there. Uh, all the other ones, because of the del their delicacy that Jim was mentioning, um, are, um, are, not, uh, are not on view because they're in, they're in storage. Any other questions? Cindy, do we have time for the next one? Uh, thank you, Ray. We have come to the close of our hour. That's what I'm thinking too, Cindy. Unfortunately, and maybe some other time we can do a part two for the pop art because the DIA actually has a very impressive and extensive collection of pop art. Thanks so much. Go well, ahead. That's Cindy. a good idea, Ray. We should do a pop art part two. Let's I think do it too. Jim, are you in? I'm in. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, thanks, Ray and Jim, uh, for presenting for everyone today. And as we've seen, these mass media technologies that were used by many pop artists, they could celebrate American modern culture, but they were also a reflection and a commentary, as Ray said, on the social and political pressures, such as the Vietnam War um, during the 60s and 70s. I just would like to go over with all of you folks before we uh, sign off that the DIA reopened on July 10th. We invite you to plan your visit by reserving a timed entry ticket via the DIA website. The museum's open Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, nine to four, and Saturday and Sunday from 10 to five. The museum is closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, our current exhibitions include Guests of Honor, Frida Kahlo and Salvador Dali, Bruegel's The Wedding Dance Revealed, which is a study um, in terms of the conservation of that painting, and bookending that uh, exhibition we have from Bruegel to Rembrandt, uh, which is a print ex exhibition in our uh, prints and photographs gallery. We have Guests of Honor from the Louvre, Houdon's Portraits of Washington and Franklin. And last but not least, we have a photographic exhibition of Michigan's Great Lakes. Our next new exhibition will be Cars and that will open on November 15th. So you can see even though we've been closed for a while, there's still a lot of action going on at the DIA. Next Thursday at one o'clock, the DIA Film Theater will be screening a film for you as Amanda mentioned, and the title of it is Mysteries of Picasso. We'll be back in two weeks, and for Howard's Fan Club, he'll be back in two weeks. And our next uh, presentation, the theme and title is Ordinary People. And it will be regarding impressionist artists who have turned their attention toward everyday people and events through works on paper. So we thank you for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate, we appreciate um, your patronage of the DIA. Thank you so much.